This is uh, part A of the ankle and foot lecture, and actually this is the part that um, you receive mostly in class, but I just wanted to spend a few minutes going over um, some stuff that we didn't quite get to um, in class today. Um, just a reminder on the announcements um, that uh, you need to complete the voiceovers. There will actually be three um, components. Um, of the voiceovers and I'm hoping to put those on a playlist here so it will be obvious what you need to do. At the end um, of the third playlist there will be a case study um, so make sure you review that. That will be the case study we discuss in class on Thursday and you'll be doing some exercise prescription with that. So moving on um, foot and ankle and lower leg. I didn't talk much about this slide uh, this morning, but this slide just shows the um, insertion areas of um, these particular muscles across the um, axis of the frontal and the sagittal axis of the joint. Um, so this may be helpful for you in the future if you're trying to figure out um, what muscles do a particular motion. So for example, um, Number one, the tibialis anterior falls in this quadrant, um, which would bring the ankle into dorsiflexion as well as inversion. Any muscle in this quadrant um, would uh, perform dorsiflexion and eversion. Of course, this quadrant would be plantar flexion, eversion, and any muscle that runs through this quadrant would be plantar flexion and inversion. That might be helpful for some of you. Discuss this in class, just the stages of gait. Um, review this if you don't quite understand um, the lower kinetic chain and what happens when you go into pronation um, at the subtalar joint. Um, the next few slides are the same ones that you have in your packet. Um, going through and finding subtalar neutral. These are the instructions. Um, if we see a situation where um, we're evaluating the rear foot, um, and we see the calcaneus at an angle where the inside of the calcaneus is elevated. Um, this is called a rear foot varus. Um, B then the person compensates by pronating that in order to get the medial heel to touch the ground. And we've got again some pictures of it um, in this uh, rear foot um, varus or great toe then is on on this side. Um, a rear foot valgus in standing, um, however this really is a little bit inaccurate because this should be um, performed in a non-weight bearing position. Um, again, foot and, um, forefoot assessment, here's the directions for that. Um, Ideally, we would have this line is perpendicular to the metatarsal headline um, of varus. If the forefoot, the great toe is up, and of valgus, the great toe is down. Um, and if the person compensates for this, then um, they actually excessively pronate in order to get that first metatarsal head down to the ground, um, which would look like an excessive pronation of the foot. Just a couple more pictures if you're struggling with um, rear foot, hind foot, varus, and valgus. Um, there's some good pictures of, of what you would see in subtalar neutral. Again, um, inversion motion should be two-thirds um, of the total hind foot motion. Eversion should be one-third. Um, this is a reminder that pronation is actually a combination of three movements of the ankle and foot, dorsiflexion, abduction, and eversion, and supination is a combination of plantar flexion, adduction, and inversion. Um, and if any of these motions is engaged, the segment will automatically perform the other motions as well. Um, so if we go into dorsiflexion um, and abduction, then you also will go into eversion. That's what that's saying. Callus patterns, um, talked about the three different orthotics and some different um, impression methods. Here's the plaster, here's the foam box. Um, orthotics versus barefoot running, it's very um, controversial um, today. Uh, I'll just briefly mention um, a comment about this and the studies that they've done. They found that when um, somebody runs, um, they call it shod, 
S-H-O-D, so they have shoes on. They have this um, pretty intense impact peak right about here um, compared to if somebody who's running barefoot. They actually don't have an impact um, peak with running, so they, they land a little smoother. They project the impact forces further up into the body. Uh, shoe anatomy, we briefly went over this. Straight curved, remember, is for somebody who needs support, and those are usually people that are pronated and curved last are for somebody who needs cushion, and those are usually um, supinated people. Here we've got a good shoe for a um, pronator. Here we've got a good shoe for a supinator, and this is kind of the middle of the line is semi-curved, so they're more of a neutral. I uh, briefly talked about this um, in class, but a slip last shoe is, gives you the most cushion. Um, the seam is down the middle, um, so that would be a great stitching that you could use for somebody that's really supinated if you could find a shoe like that. Um, a lot of the shoes um, now are the strobe elastic shoe. Um, they're stitched through here, and they've got... Um, a little um, less flexibility than a slip lasted shoe, um, but they aren't as as hard as a um, board lasted, which is just one stiff board um, through the bottom of the shoe. So it's kind of a combination, which is becoming very popular um, to try to hit a greater population. There's a combination last again. It's um, very similar to the strobel lasted shoe. Um, <clears throat> shoe wear um, can sometimes be used to indicate some foot deformities. Um, for example, somebody that has a um, medial heel counter um, and heel collapse usually is an indication there that they're an excessive pronator. So we see the medial heel is beginning to collapse on this picture. Uh, somebody with a lateral heel counter um, that moves um, laterally, um, like this. Um, one especially right here um, is usually indicative they have more rigid foot, a supinated foot, and they stay more laterally displaced. Um, for a black and helix um, toe, um, typically the toe box is too short and you won't want to try to find a shoe that has a longer one. Um, this is an interesting deal, a rigid first ray. Um, the hallux actually will wear through the upper and they have little holes. Um, up in there. So this um, whole first ray or this toe um, does not move very much or when they walk this first ray is always pulled into extension and it actually wears through um, the upper. The Brannock measuring device is a device that's used um, to um, help fit shoes and I put on your outline um, just some notes about proper shoe fit, um, that you should um, buy your shoes in the afternoons or evenings, um, get good um, cushioning if you're supinated, support if you're a pronated shoe. Um, so there's some highlights there that you can read on your own. Um, and then the um, I listed a, several different different types of shoes that are available. And then the last part, e, um, F on your notes, is lacing patterns. I won't ask you about these, just, just to know um, that sometimes you can lace your shoe in a different pattern. And that provides um, sometimes some relief. Um, for example, if you have a narrow foot, this is a good lacing pattern. Um, B is a good lacing pattern um, for wide feet. Um, these are all listed in your book, I think on page maybe 790 or something around there. Um, C is um, typically used for a woman with um, a wide forefoot and a narrower heel. Um, D, somebody that has high arches. I sometimes just will lace my shoes like this um, to relieve the crisscross um, tension that occurs from the laces because I have high arches as well. Somebody has a toe problem, um, we'll, we'll lace them kind of like this where this gray one comes up and underneath and it actually pulls up on the upper through here that can relieve some some pressure. Um, heel blisters, um, this lacing pattern here so that the tension is um, taken off, um, hopefully a little bit off of the heel. And then a dorsal foot bump. Some people have these pressure sores on the dorsum of their foot and so if we can keep the laces from coming across those that can um, relieve pain. I've actually used some of the lacing patterns in the um, clinic um, when I worked with the running 
clubs years ago and they can make a significant difference on um, pain in the foot, um, numbness, somebody has a foot that is tingling, um, you might want to try um, a different lacing pattern um, and see if that relieves their symptoms. So this is the end of the first um, video, uh, just again a review for today. Um, and then um, you can pull up the second one and that will continue on with the lecture in regards to general principles.